It's like I have been doing a lot of talking at camp meeting. You're all going to have to go home and recover from me. It has been a blessing to be here every night and to get to meet all of you guys. So thank you for having me and having our family down here. It means a lot to us. You have all blessed me a great deal. All right, let us begin with prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for the blessing that you have brought to us today. Thank you for all the commitments of your people to read their Bible this year. Lord, that brought such encouragement to me. Thank you so much for the gift of, of giving us that desire. Please help each one to, to come through and to do it and help them to be blessed, Lord. I know they'll be blessed, so thank you, Lord, already for blessing them. Lord, tonight, please give me clear thoughts. Please help everyone to uh, clear thoughts as well, Lord, that you would just give us eyes to see ears to hear. Please send your Holy Spirit into each of our hearts. Help us, Lord. We need to get ready for you to come, and Lord, it's an important topic. I just ask you to, to open all of our hearts and help us to, to truly um, prepare for your coming. Thank you, dear Jesus. We love you so much. Please help us to hear your word tonight. In your name, amen. It will require the firmest trust, the most heroic purpose, to hold fast the faith once delivered to the saints. Acts of the Apostles, page 431. It's kind of like a call to arms. My, my sermon title tonight um, is The Swelling of Jordan. I kind of got that from this text that we're going to read here, it made me think, and it's made me think a few different times, and I, I think you'll like it. Jeremiah 12, verse 5. Jeremiah 12, 5. If thou hast run with a footman, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trusteth, they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan. Turn your Bibles to Joshua, chapter 3. The swelling of Jordan. That's a story. And it's a good story. Let's read verses 14 through 17. Joshua, chapter 3. And it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as they that bear the Ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the Ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of the harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap, very far from the city Adam, that is beside Zaratan. And there... And, sorry, and those that came down toward the Sea of the Plain, even the Salt Sea, failed, and they were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on the dry ground in the midst of Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. So the Jordan River overflowing all of its banks I looked up some pictures and found some kind of cool stuff. It's over a mile wide there when it's in flood. Not all the time, but when it's in flood during the harvest. Over a mile wide and 12 feet deep and very swift, the Jordan River drops 620 feet in only 70 miles. So, I mean, that's a lot of drop in a river. So you can imagine standing there and looking at a torrent over a mile wide, 12 feet deep, that's on quite a little angle. <laughs> it's like, he makes me think, let's kayak, but they didn't have kayaks. They had to step out in faith. You know, the priests stepped up to that water and actually had to get their feet wet. Sometimes in the Bible, the Jordan River was used as a, a barrier to their advantage. We had um, Elijah crossed to the east side to hide from, from Ahab. David also crossed over to, 
to kind of avoid conflict with Absalom. So sometimes it was a barrier that they used to their advantage. But in Joshua here, it was an obstacle to overcome. Before moving on in their calling, before entering the promised land, that was like, that was the border. So that perspective, I guess, of that story is where the expression came to cross Jordan. It means to pass through something that stands in the way, okay? So as I'm talking tonight, think of that when I say you crossing Jordan, I'm meaning you passing through something that stands in, in your way. And also, this crossing Jordan makes you think about the, the real crossing Jordan that we are going to have to do, like the time of trouble, right? A big test we're going to have to pass through. The children of Israel are a type or an illustration of us. Um, of the remnant people, of, of God's people, the Israelites, they were his chosen people at the beginning, and then we're his chosen people at the end, a remnant. Uh, it's a, a piece of cloth, right? And it's just the little shred at the end that they cut off, and they usually sell it cheaper because there's not much left. But it matches exactly the first part. And, and that is us. That's the remnant church. We match the first. We keep the commandments of God, have the testimony of Jesus. It's a special calling. And, and so we can look at their history and learn something about us. Go to Galatians 3.29. It says, and if ye be Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. A quote here for you, Satan's snares are laid for us as verily as they were laid for the children of Israel just prior to their entrance into the land of Canaan. We are repeating the history of that people. Isn't that interesting? Five, five Testimonies 160. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to read uh, quite a few verses here, so we're going to start in verse 1. This is just talking about them being an example for us. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now there's a quote in a special testimony to Battle Creek. She quotes that, and then I'll read you the end, so I don't have to read this twice. The experience of Israel referred to in the above words of the apostle, and as recorded in the 105th and 106th Psalm, contains lessons of warnings that, of warning, that the people of God in these last days especially need to study. I urge that these chapters be read at least once every week. Has anybody read that, any of those chapters this week? I mean, I did, obviously. I had a heads up. But I would not have if I hadn't have read that quote. So we need to. Psalms 105, 106, in this, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 11. It has a special warning for us. It's interesting. What happened to them just before they entered Canaan after their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness? The stories in Numbers, chapter 25. Verse 
read verses 1 through 3. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat, and they bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. In Patriarchs and Prophets, she describes what happens here. And again, thinking in your mind, these are warnings and lessons that we need to learn from. At first, there was little intercourse or association between the Israelites and their heathen neighbors. But after a time, Midianitish women began to steal into their camp. Their appearance excited, no alarm, and so quietly were their plans conducted that the intention of Moses was not called to the matter. It was the object of these women in their association with the Hebrews to seduce them into transgression of the law of God and to draw their attention to heathen rites and customs and lead them into idolatry. These motives were studiously concealed under the garb of friendship so that they were not suspected, even by the guardians of the people. At Balaam's suggestion, a grand festival in honor of their gods was appointed by the king of Moab, and it was secretly arranged that Balaam should induce the Israelites to attend. Great numbers of the people joined him in witnessing the festivities. They ventured upon forbidden ground and were entangled in the snare of Satan beguiled with music and dancing, and allured by the beauty of heathen vestals, women, I assume that is, they cast off their fealty to Jehovah, and as they united in mirth and feasting and indulgence in wine, they clouded their senses and broke down their barriers of self-control. They offered sacrifices upon heathen altars and practiced, participated in the most degrading rites. The rulers and the leading men were among the first to transgress, and so many of the people were guilty that the apostasy became national. Israel joined herself to Baal Peor. She says in another place, it was when the Israelites were in a condition of outward ease and security that they were led into sin. They failed to keep God ever before them. They neglected prayer and cherished a spirit of self-confidence, ease and self-indulgence, left the citadel of the soul unguarded and debasing thoughts found entrance. It was the traitors within the walls that overthrew the strongholds of principle and betrayed Israel into the power of Satan. So all these things, again, why am I reading them? It's because it's a warning to us now. She says, with the history of the children of Israel before us, let us take heed and not be found committing the same sins and following in the same way of unbelief and rebellion. The religion of many among us will be the religion of apostate Israel because they loved their own way and forsook the way of the Lord. The trials of the children of Israel and their attitude just prior to the first coming of Christ illustrate the position of the people of God and their experience before his second coming. Jeremiah twelve eleven says, The whole land is made desolate because no man layeth it to heart. It's time that we laid it to heart. Because we, like the children of Israel, they were camped there on the border of Canaan after wandering in the wilderness. They were ready to go in. We, we have wandered in the wilderness, and we are ready to go in. Deuteronomy 10. Verse 12 and 13. It's not complicated to turn to God. I love this text. Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 and 13. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Did God protect the Israelites before they, before they sinned, before they turned away from him, this very place in their history? Do you remember what happened? Balaam, was he allowed to curse them before? He just wasn't. It, he went to do it, and he really wanted to do it. He wanted the reward of, the, of Balak. But he couldn't say even his own words. He could have, he could have no power over those people while they were obeying God. In Patriarchs and Prophets, I know I keep quoting from this, but it was so good I couldn't stop. 
While they were under divine protection, no people or nation, though aided by all the power of Satan, were able to prevail against them. And the favor of God at this time manifested toward Israel was to be an assurance of his protecting care for his obedient and faithful children in all ages. That's us. Satan can't touch us when we're obeying God. And I don't mean to say that you won't have trials and bad things happen in your life, or heartaches, or fears, or, you know, there's things that happen to us, but that Satan can't destroy us. He can't have power over us when we're, when we're in, in a close relationship with God, when we're obeying. She says that Balaam knew that the prosperity of Israel depended on their obedience to God, and that there was no way to cause their overthrow except by seducing them into sin. And apparently they trusted him too, which is, they should not have done that. So it is today, we must be obeying God in order to enter into the time just before us with the assurance of his protection. And I'm talking about the time of trouble, but I'm talking about any time of trouble in your life. Romans chapter 13. Romans 13, 11 through 14 says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and in drunkenness, not in chambering or wantonness, not in strife or in envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. The Israelites fulfilled the lust thereof at that place. And what happened to them? How many of them died? Remember? 24,000. Uh, Paul says 23,000. And I think the discrepancy there is because um, it says that also the leaders, that they went out first and they killed the leaders. So I think that's... There must have been like a thousand leaders. I'm not sure, but that would kind of explain that. How sad that they didn't hold fast their faith. Sister White says it was by associating with idolaters, and joining in their festivities, that the Hebrews were led into transgression, to tra transgress the law of God and bring his judgments upon the nation. And so now it is, by leading the followers of Christ to associate with the ungodly, and unite in their amusements that Satan is most successful in alluring them to sin. That's us, and to sin. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. 2 Corinthians 6, 17. God requires of his people now as great of a distinction from the world in customs and habits and principles as he required of Israel anciently. And if they faithfully follow the teachings of his word, this distinction will exist. It cannot be otherwise. I like that. We don't need to worry about this. This is something that if we follow his word, it just exists. 1 John 2.15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And James 4, 4 says, the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So as a people, we're living in a day of judgment. We all know this. But the books are being examined. And soon, right now we have a mediator. And, but the day still approaches when we will not. So we're living, or are people living in times of judgment. It's interesting, if you look through the Bible, and you can look at how the people lived, in models of judgment or in times of judgment. There is a lot of them. I picked out three to jog our brains a little bit. But I encourage you to study many of them because they all have bring about little points. The first one that I'm going to share is, is Genesis 35. So this was a time when something happened and the people are being judged or looked at by God and what they're doing. Genesis 35, starting in verse 1. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. 
Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the day which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all their strange gods, which were in their hand, and all their earrings, which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. We can learn things from that. What about the Day of Atonement? Leviticus. What did they do then? Leviticus 23, verse 27. That's the first one, yeah. Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Turn back to chapter 16. It talks more about the day of atonement. Verse 29 to 31 here. And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you, to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. So again, we're looking at how they lived. Last one, Exodus 33. This is after the golden calf episode. Let's start in verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, saying unto thy seed will I give it. And I'll send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I, milk and honey, okay, so that, he's quoting himself, that was his covenant that he had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now he says, for I will not go up into the, in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee. So he had changed his mind, he's telling him. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up in the midst of thee in a moment, and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. So we can study these models of judgment, because we are living in the antitypical day of atonement. Study these models of judgment and the other ones that are in the Bible. How did they dress? How did they eat? What did they do? How did they pray? How did they afflict their souls? Those instructions are for us. And so we talked about several key elements to, to our salvation this week. Um, we've been going over basically principles, righteousness by faith. There's no fear for the judgment if we have Christ in this. If we're living in a relationship with him, we have no fear. But if we're not, how will we do in the swelling of Jordan? Not well. So it's time that we wake up and make sure that we're right with the Lord. Oh, what's HL? Healthful living? Okay. I have a little bit of a blank brain tonight. <laughs> Page 427. I believe it's healthful living. The signs of the times are ominous. Coming events cast their shadows before. The spirit of God is withdrawing from the earth, and calamity follows calamity. Where is security? There is assurance in nothing human or earthly. We all feel this. Satan has set all his agencies at work that men may be deceived, occupied, and entranced until the door of mercy is forever shut. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. I have a couple quotes, texts written down here. I'm just going to read through them so that we don't have this gaps between. Hosea 10:12 says, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Ephesians 5:14 says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, 
redeeming the time because the days are evil. Proverbs 3, 7 says, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And again, the quote that we started with, it will require the firmest trust, the most heroic purpose, to hold fast the faith once delivered to the saints. You know, in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, there's um, 21 parables of Jesus. I think that's the right number. If somebody comes up with another one, just, you can email me. But as far as I know, there's 21. And of those, there's 14 of them that start with the kingdom of God. Like, the kingdom of God is likened unto... Da, da, da. And it's interesting because those, I believe, he's talking to his church more than the world. Does that make sense? The kingdom of God is likened unto... So in those 14 parables, Jesus is especially concerned about the spiritual condition of his church. So see if it makes it a little bit more interesting to you. If you read through Matthew, maybe you're starting in the New Testament when you read the Bible... Um, think about it. It's interesting. So in Matthew 25, we all know this. I don't, I don't think I need to read through the parable of the ten virgins. But I want to draw some facts out of it. It is a parable that starts, And then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. So they, are we all pretty familiar with this story? They all had oil. To start, the foolish ran out. They had lamps. The lamps represented the word of God. You know, the Bible says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Now, oil in the sanctuary was used to set something apart um, for holy service, like the furniture, the priests, um, consecration. So these, these ten virgins have all been set apart for God's service. So you really, you're looking at, at your church. The oil also represents, of course, the Holy Spirit, the light that we have to share. I want to read you a, a short quote from the book, Revive Us Again by Mark Finley. I just started it, but it's excellent as far as I've read. He says, the foolish virgins are content with a stale, superficial experience from the past. And although they acknowledge the truth, the truth has not transformed their lives. The old nature dominates their thoughts, their actions. They know the theory of the truth, but have not been radically changed by it. They have a casual understanding of the doctrines of the church, but not a hard experience. They have the outer without the inner. They have the form without the substance. They have the theory without the reality. We don't want to be that. Go to Ezekiel 33, verse 31, if you have your Bibles with you. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show great love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. That reminded me of the, of the foolish virgins. I think there's a parallel there. So the foolish virgins are informed, but they're not transformed. Can we? So if we want to be the wise virgins, we not only had to be informed, but we had to be transformed. How do we get transformed? By studying our Bibles, by reading the Word. I think I just mixed up my pages, but that's okay. And we all want Jesus to transform us. So it's time for us to get our feet wet. We all have river Jordans, not just the time of trouble. That is a huge one. But we have river Jordans in our life that we come up to every day. It's the little things. And so when we come up to our river Jordan, something that separates, something that you're like, if you stay on this side, you're not walking with Jesus anymore. We have to cross all the little ones because they're a barrier. And sometimes it is difficult. Um, God's values aren't always politically correct. You're going to have to get out of your comfort zone to follow Jesus. It's always been that way. But our calling is still clear. So every time that we reach something in our life that's difficult for us, but that is 
intercepting our walk with Jesus, have faith. Get your feet wet. He's going to part that problem. He's going to help us. I like this quote. Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 541, says, True faith and true prayer, how strong they are. They are as the two arms by which the human suppliant lays hold upon power of infinite love. Faith is trusting in God, believing that he loves us and knows what is for our best good. Thus, instead of our own way, it leads us to choose his way. In place of our ignorance, it accepts his wisdom, and in place of our weakness, his strength. In place of our sinfulness, his righteousness. So don't let the Jordan rivers that are in your life hold you back, whether it's a job or a relationship or, you know, whatever it is. You know what things you have in your life. And we need to make that decision to let God control, to, let, to, to have trust in him that he's going to see us through. And don't wait until the time of trouble <laughs> to start practicing because it's just, it's a huge trial. It has to start today with the little things, the nearest things, like exercising faith in your family, being a loving Christian in your church. You can't start when things are really bad at the end. It's, it's not going to work. That's what J.D. talked about in the children's story. Be faithful in the little things. Start where you are. This next quote is Christ Object Lessons, page 360. The humblest duties are not to be ignored. Any honest work is a blessing, and faithfulness in it may prove a training for higher trusts. However lowly, any work done for God with a full surrender of self is acceptable to him as the highest service. No offering is small that is given with true-heartedness and gladness of soul. Wherever we may be, Christ bids us take up the duty that presents itself. If this is in the home, take hold willingly and earnestly to make home a pleasant place. If you are a mother, train your children for Christ. This is as verily a work for God as is that of the minister in the pulpit. If your duty is in the kitchen, seek to be a perfect cook. Prepare food that will be healthful, nourishing, appetizing. And as you employ the best ingredients in preparing food, remember that you are to give your mind the best thoughts. If it is your work to till the soil or to engage in any other trade or occupation, make a success of the present duty. Put your mind on what you're doing and in all your work represent Christ. Do as he would do in your place. However small your talent, God has a place for it. That one talent, wisely used, will accomplish its appointed work. By faithfulness in the little duties, we are to work on the plan of addition, and God will work for us on the plan of multiplication. These littles will become the most precious influences in his work. That's a promise, too. Let a living rain, faith run like threads of gold through the performance of even the smallest duties, then all the daily work will promote Christian growth. There will be a continual looking unto Jesus. Love for him will give vital force to everything that's undertaken. Thus, through the right use of our talents, we may link ourselves by a golden chain to the higher world. This is true sanctification. For sanctification consists in the cheerful performance of daily duties in perfect obedience to the will of God. I love that. Be faithful right where you are. God has, has that place specifically for you. Be faithful there. In the silly, puny, mundane things that we're all like, well, that's boring. That's where we're to be faithful. Start where you are. He that's faithful in the least is faithful also in much. And we've talked about how this week, how to start being faithful in the little things in your life. Look to Jesus, see in him our deliverance. Jesus only. Let him heal us of our sin. There's power in the word. He made it so we can overcome because it's his word. We can claim that power. Put your will on his side. Just choose him. and Read his word every day to discover how he wants to prepare you, what, what you need to do to be ready, to be prepared. We don't want to miss it. We don't want to miss heaven over some silly stumbling block with Jordan River in our life right now. You know, there's a story that is in a book that I, I think I read it probably the first time when I was 12. Um, 
It's called Too Slow Getting Off. And many of you may know it. Um, Marjorie Lewis Lloyd wrote that book. It's a lovely little book. If you have it, get it. I didn't see it on our table, or I would tell you, but um, it's a lovely little book. The last chapter in it is called Guardian Angel. And from the first time I read it, I just, it made an impression on me. And so I wanted to share it with you. Hopefully, it'll make you think like it makes me think. I'm going to tell it to you because it's kind of long, so I'm going to hopefully get the highlights. But it starts off with, it's um, trying to give you the idea, a story of what happens in heaven when someone chooses not to follow Jesus, when someone chooses Satan instead of Christ. And this man, in the hypothetical story, asks an angel in heaven, he says, why are the harps all silent? Why is there no music anywhere in heaven? And the angel comes over and he says, well, it's because another name just now has been taken from the book of life. And it's a sad day for all the angels, but especially for me, because I was his guardian angel. When I tried to do things that would help him make choice for Christ, I'd protect him, I was with him his whole life, but He's made his decision now, and all heaven can't change it. And the man feels bad, and he says, well, yeah, that is sad, but surely it's only a momentary disappointment. I mean, the name's removed, but heaven has more people to win, more songs to sing. And the angel says, no, no, it's, that's not all. Come with me. And it, the angel takes this man, and he takes him to a big building where there's crowns everywhere and as they get to it another angel flies over and he says look at this crown I just finished it it's incredible do you think he'll like it and the angel looks at it and he turns away how do I tell him that someone didn't want that crown well they go to the next place and they they go to this table and it's covered with food and he goes down the side and he goes to a a name tag, and he takes it out and puts another in its place, and so on. He gets the harp. They have to change the name of the harp. And finally he gets to the mansion, but Jesus is there. And the angel's taking the name off the golden plate above the door. And Jesus asks, he says, did he say he'd rather have the one that he built down there? Don't they want to come home? The angel just turns away in sorrow. He can't answer. He's, he's so sad. And the man is standing there. He's watching all this. And suddenly this fear and dread grows in him. And he asks the angel, he says, Who, whose name was taken off the book today? And the angel smiles gently and, and takes the man down the street. And as they're going along this row of mansions, the man sees one. And he's like, that's the one that I would pick. And the angel stops in front of it. And the man sees his name above the door. It's not too late. And he's so happy. And he realizes, he wonders how in the world he could have been so indifferent, so cold, so slow, so lazy about it. And it ends with all heaven frames with silence, the words of the Savior. Don't they want to come home? I believe each one of us here, we want to go home. But ask yourself that. Are your actions in agreement with what you say? Do you want to go home? And if we do, we need to get our feet wet and cross these obstacles, these little Jordan rivers, these things in our life that are keeping us from following Christ. It's not too late for any of us here. Turn your Bibles to Revelation 21.4. I love this text. I love a lot of texts, but I really love this text. Revelation 21, verse 4. It says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Where are we at this point? Heaven. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. 
I can't wait to be in a place where those things can't exist. And it's exciting when you think about, I don't know if you ever think about this, I think about this, getting to meet these people, the saints of all the ages. I mean, what will it be like to meet Daniel? What will it be like to meet David? What would it be like to meet Ellen White? I mean, these are people that are such a huge part of our life. They know nothing of us, of course, but I mean, we're going to be, it's just going to be, wow. Sister White tells us that we will recognize their voices from reading the Bible. Isn't that cool? Uh, I just, I can't wait. And I think, most of all, obviously meeting all those people is incredible, but what will it be like when your eyes first see Jesus? Oh, there's just nothing that could possibly compare to that moment in time, and it's real. It's a real moment that will exist in your life in the future if you decide to follow Jesus, but it will exist. And, oh, I can't wait for heaven. I love this quote. It's in Early Writings, page 289. It says, language is altogether too feeble to attempt a description of heaven. As the scene rises before me, I am lost in amazement, carried away with a surpassing splendor and excellent glory. I laid on my pen and exclaimed, oh, what love, what wondrous love. The most exalted language fails to describe the glory of heaven or the matchless depths of a Savior's love. You know, tonight's our last night together. Last time I get to speak to you, and there's a chance that we'll never meet again in this, in this world. I mean, I live a long ways away, and unless you're planning a trip to Montana soon. But you know what? I'm going to be in heaven by God's grace, and I am going to look for you guys there. I am. I'm going to look for you on the cloud. Look for me, okay? It's a real time, and when we get to heaven... Are we going to sit and we're going to talk? We're going to say, ah, oh, Western Slope can't be any. I mean, I, I read it dedicated my life. I mean, I, that really was a game changer for me. I know I will. This is a game changer for me. It's been such a blessing to get to share my faith. This, you know, I've never done this before. <laughs> I'm a little housewife up in the mountains that homeschools children and has a garden and rides horses. And, you know, I, I'm pretty simple. But you know what? It's been a blessing. I've gotten to share some of my experience with you and to meet you. I know that, that this is all written in the book of life. And so I will be looking for you, and I know I will see you there. So hold fast till he comes. Tonight, I want to sing a song, but I'd like it if we all sang the song together, if you know it. It's till the storm passes by. Oh. No. 
tonight, could we all pray together? I don't know, um, at least in our family, we usually do it on Friday night, but we pray the Lord's Prayer. And uh, could we do that tonight together, all of us? Just say it in unison. JD, would you mind leading in it? Because you always do that at home. And I... Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 